this lesson is about Carl McIntyre, one of the founders and most active members and leaders of the Bible Presbyterian denomination in the United States, and a man who's had a great impact on a lot of leaders in the reform movement, both here and also in the Christian movement all around the world. In this lesson, I'm not going to be able to cover all of his life since uh, he did so many things over such a long period, but I've, I'm going to be concentrating pretty much on the first earlier years of his ministry, and uh, by so doing, especially showing his influence on the beginnings of our Bible Presbyterian denomination. Now, there is a book written by Gladys Tisk Rhodes called McIntyre, and uh, her daughter, Nancy Tisk, uh, married one of our Bible Presbyterian ministers, uh, Robert Anderson, and uh, she lives in this area. And if you ever get a chance to see her, you can ask her questions. Uh, she has a huge fund of knowledge about Dr. McIntyre and his church and his ministry, having grown up in the church and her mother having written his biography. Carl McIntyre was born in 1906 and uh, was named Charles Curtis McIntyre Jr. after his father, but he commonly was called Carl, and that's what he was known as, Carl McIntyre. He lived to be 95 years old and just died in 2002 at the age of uh, 95, almost 96. I think he had one month to go before his 96th birthday. Extremely active man, energetic man, uh, through all of his life. He was known to most of us through the years as Dr. McIntyre, and uh, that's because he, he uh, was given an honorary doctor's degree from Bob Jones University uh, early in his ministry, and uh, there was a good fellowship between him and Bob Jones and the other members of that uh, school through the years. Uh, Dr. McIntyre was born in Ypsilanti, Michigan, and uh, his, he, was, he grew up in a pastor's home. His father was a Presbyterian minister, but when uh, Carl was a young boy, his father suffered a nervous breakdown, and uh, eventually he and his wife divorced, and uh, Carl was raised by his mother, primarily. His mother was a very well-educated woman. Her parents had been missionaries among the Choctaw Indians, and uh, uh, she was a great student of the Bibles. Uh, Dr. McIntyre used to mention how she memorized the book of Proverbs and was always quoting various verses out of the book of Proverbs to her children uh, as they were growing up. <clears throat> um, his mother, Hetty, uh, became then a dean of women at the State Teachers College in Oklahoma, and she was, uh, as I said, well-educated. And uh, throughout his life, Dr. McIntyre associated with women who were well-educated and strong leaders in their own right. As uh, he went to college then in Oklahoma, he was a very successful student. He was elected student body president and uh, was a champion debater, debating uh, the top debaters from other universities in the area and uh, had a, a very bright future ahead of him. The family did not have much money and so as a student he had to earn money and he often spoke about how he used to sell maps for a living. He would go around to the various families, the farmers' families in that area, and and uh, drive up to the farmhouse and sit at their kitchen, kitchen table and, and bring out these maps. And he said everybody needed three things in life. You need a Bible and a newspaper and a map. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so most of the people there had Bibles and uh, newspapers, but he provided the maps. And uh, a lot of times these farmers also were poor, remember, uh, during these years, uh, the uh, farms were hard hit through the Depression years and beyond, and uh, they didn't have much money, but so often he said he would get paid with uh, blackstrap molasses in uh, big jugs. And so uh, he, he would accept uh, this molasses as payment for the maps, and then he would take this molasses into the towns around, and then he would auction it off there, on the street and get money uh, by selling the molasses to people in the towns. And he could get a much better price for it in the towns than he could out in the countryside. 
So you can see from a very young age, he was a man of great energy and enterprise and uh, was able to support himself uh, through school and uh, seemed to make a good, a good income by uh, this hard, hard work that required a lot of personal contact. It was through these years, actually through this experience, he said that he was able to uh, become later a very successful radio broadcaster. And he often spoke of when he uh, broadcasted on the radio, he had a microphone, of course, and in a studio of some kind. And he often uh, would, you know, people would be kind of intimidated when they got on the radio with him. But he said, well, just think about it like you're sitting at the kitchen table with a farmer's family and just talk to them that way. And that's what, that was his style. And he was extremely successful at that. And many have said he was actually the beginner of the talk radio in America and had a, a, a great success in that area. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, he met in college a young woman named Ferry Davis from Texas, and uh, uh, they uh, became more and more friendly, and obviously, uh, eventually, uh, were married uh, a couple of years later. Um, she was a home economics major. Uh, she had decided she wanted to be a pastor's wife, and a pastor's wife needed to be able to cook meals and do well, so she majored in home economics, but uh, she apparently had a hard time cooking uh, biscuits. Uh, Dr. McIntyre said that after they first got married that uh, she cooked biscuits for him, and uh, when he tried eating it, it was rather hard and heavy, and, and then he uh, said to her something like, uh, this is heavy work for a light lady. <laughs> but uh, she was his faithful a wife and a helper through all most of his life. Uh, she she did die later on uh, in in his elderly years. He remarried one of his secretaries, uh, but all through life uh, he was faithfully accompanied by his wife Ferry. They had three children, two daughters and a son, uh, whom I was able to meet at different occasions. And uh, his son became a famous uh, historian, professor at University of Toronto, where he. Uh, retired uh, later. <clears throat> uh, in the year 1928, um, well, let me just back up. Uh, during the years he was dating Ferry, he told a story that uh, he would walk across town. He lived on one side of town and she lived on the other side of town and he did not have a car, so he had to walk one mile into town, through the town, and then one mile out to Ferry's house. Then he'd walk home one mile plus one mile plus the town going back. And he said one night on his way to see Ferry, and he was walking down the sidewalk happily expecting to see his girlfriend and, and his uh, erstwhile friend. And he told us the friend's name, and I don't remember what the name was, uh, had strung a string or a wire across the sidewalk where he was walking to trip him. And uh, he fell down, he hit that, he fell down and he hit his face on the on the, on the sidewalk there and he had a bloody nose and got on his shirt and everything and uh, so when he got to Ferry's house it was quite a sight to get cleaned up and he often told that story matter of fact I think he always told that story when he preached on the book of Jude and uh, I've heard him preach on Jude several times and at the end of the sermon when he got to that verse now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you, uh, present you faultless before the presence of his glory, uh, prevent you from falling, he would always tell that story as uh, uh, he needed protection from falling in that case, but the Lord does protect us when Satan strings wires across our path. Well, he went to Princeton Seminary to become a Presbyterian minister like his father before him and others in his family, and in those years, of course, in 1928, that was in the midst of the fundamentalist modernist conflict going on in the Presbyterian Church. In 1924, the more than a thousand Presbyterian ministers had signed the Auburn Affirmation, where they said you don't have to believe these fundamental Christian doctrines to be a good Presbyterian. Um, <clears throat> and the people that signed that, the ministers that signed that, uh, were in various positions in the Presbyterian Church, and some of them were actually associated with Princeton Seminary, 
and also with the various presbyteries where uh, um, Princeton was located in that general region of the country. Now, Dr. Machen, uh, J. Ressa Machen, was the leader of the fundamentalists, of course, and he was in the Philadelphia Presbytery, uh, while uh, Dr. McIntyre later became active in the Eastern New Jersey Presbytery. So they were in different presbyteries right across the river from each other uh, at that time. <clears throat> but as a student, he was greatly impressed by Machen's scholarship and uh, his activity in fighting the modernism in the Presbyterian Church and became a real follower of Machen. And uh, uh, at that point in 1929, the following year, the um, Presbyterian General Assembly uh, had decided to reorganize Princeton Seminary and allow the board of directors to be changed so that, actually combined, so that there would be members of that board who had signed the Auburn Affirmation. And this was a very serious uh, declension for that seminary because Princeton was the last holdout of the fundamentalists in among the seminaries of the Presbyterian Church. So at that point, uh, Machen said he could no longer serve at Princeton Seminary, and uh, he left the seminary to form Westminster Theological Seminary in 1929, and he took three other faculty members with him. So there were four original faculty members of Westminster, um, in addition to Machen, we had Cornelius Van Til, Paul Woolley, and Ned Stonehouse. And then uh, later John Murray joined them, and then of course others through the years. So Dr. McIntyre, at that time Carl McIntyre, had already had a year of seminary, but then he went with Machen to join the, the student body at Westminster. And so he was there for an additional two years and graduating in 1931. Um, <clears throat> in 1931, it was a very eventful year for him. He not only graduated from seminary, but he also married Ferry and uh, began his life then as a graduate of the seminary, a married man, and then pastor. And that same year, he became a pastor of the Chelsea Presbyterian Church in Atlantic City, New Jersey. He was in that church for two years as the pastor. And then two years later, he was called to become the pastor of the Presbyterian Church of Collingswood, New Jersey. Now, Collingswood, New Jersey is a small uh, suburban type town uh, on the east side of the Delaware River there across from Philadelphia. So you can just cross the bridge and go from one to the other. And actually when I lived in Philadelphia, for a while I attended the Collingswood Church and we would drive maybe 35, 40 minutes to get to church from Faith Seminary. Uh, as, a, as a pastor of that church, he was the youngest pastor uh, in to, to come to that church, I believe, and also in the Presbytery. And that church was the largest church in the Presbytery. So that was quite an honor. Well, he was a very gifted student and very active and successful preacher. And, uh, he fit into that congregation very well. So when he came to that church as pastor, there was already there, uh, of course, it was a well-organized congregation, and they had various uh, groups in the church that met, and one of them was the Ladies Missionary Society. And this missionary society was getting correspondence from various Presbyterian missionaries, and uh, they were finding out how liberalism, modernism, was infecting the mission field. And some missionaries going out from the Presbyterian Mission Board were actually promoting um, liberal theology and also uh, were sympathetic to uh, more left-wing political ideas as well. And uh, uh, later on, when the communists uh, took over in China, for example, uh, some of the teachings were uh, being promoted actually by various missionaries before that uh, in China. So it was a bad situation, and Machen, of course, had been trying to correct this situation, and this just became more and more evident until, finally, in 1933, uh, Machen started the Independent Board for Presbyterian Foreign Missions because he could no longer, in good conscience, support the mission board of the Presbyterian Church, which was sending out a false gospel, as well as there were good missionaries, but also these modernist missionaries. And uh, 
So he started this new mission board where churches and individuals could support this new mission board, independent board, without compromising their ideals and still uh, would be Presbyterian. Well, the Presbyterian authorities, of course, uh, the, the General Assembly did not like this. Uh, they didn't mind a whole lot when Machen started Westminster Seminary because that didn't really take away very much money from them. But missionaries, that's something else because that's a big, a big uh, do donor designation. So they immediately, in the, Pres in the General Assembly of 1934, issued a mandate that all of the members of this new independent board for Presbyterian foreign missions would have to cease and desist and immediately resign from the board or else be subject to the discipline of the church. Now, when Machen started this board in 1933, he was seeking various pastors and so on to be members of the board, and he invited Dr. McIntyre, Carl McIntyre at that time, to be uh, one of the early founding members of the board, and, and he accepted that and was active with Machen in the <clears throat> independent board. Well, in 1934, when this mandate came down, the board members had to make a decision. Will they remain in the board and face this discipline of the church, or would they withdraw from the board? And several of them did withdraw, and these were good conservative Presbyterian ministers and, and others, but they did not want to be in disobedience, defiance of the church government, so they withdrew from the board, but many of them stuck it out and uh, were willing to sacrifice their career, their reputation in the church, uh, in order to be faithful to their missionary uh, purpose, to preach the true gospel, and to be faithful to the gospel itself. So, the various presbyteries began the trials of these men. And as I said, Dr. McIntyre was a member of the um, Eastern New Jersey Presbytery. When they met, uh, the charges were brought against him. Six counts were brought against him. And then uh, the Presbytery had their trial and found him guilty of three of these six counts. And I wrote down the three charges here that uh, they found him guilty. Number one, defiance of the government and discipline of the church. Number two, unfaithful in maintaining the peace of the church. And number three, a violation of his ordination vows. So, uh, of course, the Machen and these other men pointed out that they never made a vow that they would support the agencies of the church. They made a vow to be faithful to the gospel and to the peace and purity of the church. And uh, they were by no means trying to disrupt the peace of the church, but they were trying to support a true gospel. Well, uh, the Presbytery was not too convinced by these and found him guilty of those three. And then his case was appealed along with these other men's cases. It was appealed to the General Assembly in 1936, and then they were referred over to the Judicial Commission. And uh, the Judicial Commission in all these cases confirmed the judgments of the presbyteries and allowed the charges to remain and the people then to be guilty of discipline or to be disciplined by the presbyteries. And one of the measures was to be uh, removal of their uh, credentials as ministers, in other words, to depose them uh, from the ministry. Uh, Dr. McIntyre and the other men at that point renounced the jurisdiction of the church. They said the church had gone against its own constitution and against the scripture, and therefore they were no longer recognizing it as a true church in this regard and no longer had jurisdiction over them as far as they were concerned, and they went about their business. And uh, the, the General Assembly continued with the, with the charges and, and the various penalties after they had done this, but the uh, the men were not there to have it done to them, <laughs> but they went ahead anyway and, and uh, went through with that discipline. After this happened, um, there was the question then of the church property. Now, Dr. McIntyre's church uh, supported him wholeheartedly in this endeavor. Uh, there was an overwhelming majority of the members who uh, were, wanted to and were willing to uh, leave the Presbyterian Church USA. 
Now they had bought their building for many years before. It was paid for. They had in the building many possessions, including uh, not only like hymnals, but communion set. They had a beautiful communion set with silver cups and uh, very, very nice uh, uh, arrangements. Plus they had, of course, uh, bank accounts and savings and so on. And all of that, the presbytery claimed, belonged to the presbytery and not to the local congregation. And uh, uh, the local congregation fought that. But back in the 1920s, the Presbyterian General Assemblies had had changed the rules so that church properties would belong to the presbyteries. And uh, when the Bible Presbyterian Church started later on, that was one of the big things that put into the Constitution was that the properties belong to the local church and that the uh, any action trying to change that uh, would be illegal and uh, would not be constitutional. And not only that, they said this particular article that says this is unchangeable, unamendable. <laughs> so we can't even amend the Constitution to allow presbyteries to take over church properties. So uh, that was as a result of their experience here. There was another church nearby in the area, I think it was in Philadelphia, called, uh, well, it was a Presbyterian church, and they had actually had the presbytery come in and change the locks on the church door so that the... Uh, regular church members couldn't come in. And uh, so they had to leave their building and they opened a new building and they called it the Church of the Open Door. And uh, they, they said they would never have a lock on the door. Well, eventually they had to put locks on the doors because of crime and so on, but uh, uh, <laughs> that's sad state of affairs. But uh, this was extremely tense, you might say, time uh, for the church. Uh, my pastor in California, when I was a boy, was named John Janbaz, um, was actually a teenager who was a member of Dr. McIntyre's church at this time. And he said he and a friend of his, who later became a missionary to the Navajo Indians, uh, were both teenagers, and they, they volunteered, along with other young people, to sleep in the church at night uh, during this time so that if anybody tried to come and change the locks, they could raise the alarm. And their, their job was, if somebody tried to come in and break in or something, they would ring the bells of the church. And this would sort of like <laughs> summon the people to come to their rescue. And he said it was quite spooky in this old, big old church at night, sleeping on the pews. But uh, <laughs> uh, as it worked out, this didn't happen, and that was good. Another thing that they would do is that the elders of the church during sermon time, would act, during the Sunday service, would actually sit in a wedge formation in front of the pulpit, uh, on both sides of the pulpit, like the letter V, uh, protecting the pulpit in case anybody from the presbytery would try to come to disrupt the service and take over the pulpit and declare the church vacant. So uh, a lot of tension in those days, but uh, uh, it went through the courts and eventually uh, they did have to leave that building. Uh, but before that happened, uh, just a few other events transpired, uh, which are of interest, of course, to us. Uh, after being uh, kicked out, you might say, of the Presbyterian Church, Machen and the others formed the Presbyterian Church of America in 1936, and that was to be a denomination that would be faithful to the uh, creed and the traditions of the Northern Presbyterian Church, the Presbyterian Church USA. And uh, Machen expected a large number of people to join with him, but actually that did not happen. Uh, he was very disappointed with the uh, number of people that were conservative, Bible believers that didn't like the modernism, but they were unwilling to join in this new denomination because, often because of associations with the old church, they, they loved their building, they loved their, uh, the people that were in the denomination, and for the ministers, they had pensions that the domination would pay them. But if they left the church, these, they would lose their pensions. And especially for older men, this was a great uh, uh, sacrifice for them to make. So um, in the case of young men like Carl McIntyre, it wasn't that big of a deal. But uh, for older men, it was. And anyway, Mason was disappointed uh, that so few joined in this PC of A. Uh, shortly after this, uh, Meachin died on January the 1st, 1937, when he caught pneumonia. Uh, 
Uh, right before he died, uh, there was a struggle on the independent board for Presbyterian foreign missions of those who have pulled out of the church. And uh, um, it's the beginning kind of a friction between uh, those who followed Machen more closely and then young, some other men like Carl McIntyre who um, wanted to sort of have their own leadership and not have Machen lead so much. And uh, anyway, Machen was not reelected as president of the independent board. Uh, and some of the men uh, left the board at that point. But then Machen died in 1937, and there was a division of that early PC of A church, and uh, the issues which are, would involve a much longer class here uh, basically were on eschatology and then on Christian liberty, uh, uh, being premillennial and being teetotalers, on one side, on the other side, more amillennial, and uh, allowing for Christians to drink alcohol. Drinking of alcohol was a big issue in, in America in 1920, the beginning of Prohibition, when Carl McIntyre was about 14 years old, and uh, the Presbyterian Church in that time was in favor of Prohibition, and he was too. And then when FDR was president in 1933, that was revoked, and uh, that was controversial. So these issues were still front and center in the minds of many Presbyterians in those days. So the First Bible Presbyterian Church, excuse me, First Bible Presbyterian Synod was held in 1938 in September, and uh, Carl McIntyre's church is where it was held at. Now getting back to his local church, in March of 1938, the court cases finally were concluded and it was clear that they would have to leave their building and all the possessions and all their assets behind. There was a very small group, less than 50 people, I forget the exact number, that wanted to stay with the denomination. So they inherited this huge church and all that was there, and 1,200 people were forced out. And uh, so the last Sunday night of March the 27th, uh, they went out after the service onto the front lawn of the church and they sang two hymns, Faith of Our Fathers and Savior Like a Shepherd Lead Us. And then they all marched to a new piece of property that they had purchased uh, where they were going to be meeting the following Sunday. And uh, this new property was just, just a field, basically. And they, uh, they went out there, and I was able in earlier years to talk to some of the people who were there at that time and uh, they, they would recount that event with great emotion. Uh, sometimes they would cry and see them as they remembered that evening as they walked out of their church and left everything behind. Well, that next week they were able to uh, buy or obtain a large tent, which they erected on that property, and then uh, had communion that Sunday using paper cups. <laughs> and it's just uh, starting over again. Uh, later on, they were able to build a uh, what they call the tabernacle, uh, a large auditorium on that place, and then later on to build a, a nice, very nice uh, a church sanctuary next, next to the tabernacle, uh, which is still there today. So that is the beginning of the Bible Presbyterian Church of Collingswood, New Jersey, and that's where the Bible Presbyterians held their first synod in September of 1938. During those next few years, many others joined in the Bible Presbyterian Church, churches and ministers. Uh, then we came right up to World War II, of course, starting in 1939. And then at the end of 1941, the Americans went to war. And then for the next four years, we had World War II. During those years, it was a tremendous amount of Christian witness, especially among the military. A lot of patriotic fervor going on, of course as uh, the fight waged against uh, Nazism and fascism. And uh, then later, after the war was over in 1945, there was a growing uh, fear and awareness of uh, communism as an enemy of the gospel and of freedom. In 1941, Dr. McIntyre and others, actually two denominations, formed the American Council of Christian Churches, by which we belonged to for many years. and. Uh, it was a fundamentalist organization 
with separatism being part of its creed, you might say, that uh, we could not be in fellowship, in, in ecclesiastical fellowship with unbelief, and therefore you could not be a member of the American Council and still be within one of the modernist denominations or associated with the liberal uh, Federal Council of Churches, which later became the National Council of Churches. <clears throat> okay, um, I'm just getting to go ahead, take a little bit more here. <laughs> um, the the uh, many of the conservative leaders wanted to stand up for the truths of the gospel, I guess, modernism, but did not want to split from these more liberal churches or modernist churches or compromising churches. Uh, J. Elwin Wright was one of these leaders. Harold John Ockengay was another, and Dr. McIntyre was very familiar with John Ockengay. Uh, I understand John Ockengay was the best man at, at his way. So, uh, uh, but he disagreed on how it should be done. He felt that they should stay in the, the, these denominations. And they wanted to have some organization, though, to encourage and help fight modernism. And they were thinking about how to, how to do this. So in 1941, uh, as the American Council Church had just been forming, uh, some of these men were gathering and they had a committee to start to investigate starting a new organization. And Carl McIntyre sent them a motion. He, was, he took part in some of their first meetings and he, he, he raised a motion that they would simply join with the American Council of Churches. And uh, this motion was tabled at first and then it was brought up again and discussed in their meeting and they decided not to do that because they didn't want to insist on separation. Uh, they wanted to allow people to stay in. So they rejected Carl McIntyre's motion and formed the National Association of Evangelicals in 1942. And uh, to this day, of course, we see that sort of a middle ground position and the NAE today has become much more uh, liberal than it was when it first started. Uh, in the next years that followed, Dr. McIntyre was very active. As I said, he was extremely active in many areas uh, in the formation of various agencies of our church. Uh, he had already been, been active in the beginning of Faith Theological Seminary in Philadelphia. Uh, he was active, obviously, in the Board of Foreign Missions, the Independent Board for Presbyterian Foreign Missions. Um, they began a board for home missions uh, two colleges, Shelton College on the East Coast and Highland College on the West Coast. Uh, the Christian Beacon Incorporated was an organization that he directed by and large. It included the Christian Beacon newspaper, which was published regularly, uh, eight large pages. Uh, Christian Admiral Bible Conference Center in Cape May, New Jersey. And then the Gateway to the Stars Bible Conference Center in Cape Canaveral, Florida. These are just a few of the agencies that uh, he was very active in leading, uh, beginning and leading in various capacities. What a lot of people probably don't appreciate about him is his preaching and his work uh, preaching and writing. Um, his sermons were uh, always effective, especially in the earlier years. Um, and, and later, from time to time, he would preach real uh, zingers, I guess you could say. Uh, tremendous impact. One of his most famous sermons was on Psalm 22, uh, the prediction of the crucifixion of Christ. Uh, Bob Jones Sr. heard that sermon, and he said that it was like he was at the foot of the cross when he heard that sermon. Uh, very impressed by it. Uh, I was able uh, to procure mimeographed copies of some of his early sermons. One of them was a series on the five points of Calvinism, which uh, was very well developed. Uh, Dr. Magdara used to say that when he started out, he would have topical sermons like that more frequently, but then as uh, he um, continued gaining experience in preaching, he discovered that it was more effective, at least for him, simply to preach from the Bible and uh, to go read a chapter or something and then preach through that. And so he developed more of a biblical approach, you might say, in his outlining. Um, he wrote many books. Many of his books were actually compendium compendia of his sermons uh, concerning the Bible. I've here written down five books uh, that he wrote, um, A Cloud of Witnesses, based on Hebrews 11, For Such a Time as This, uh, the book of Esther, 
uh, Better Than Seven Sons, the book of Ruth, the book of Nehemiah, the wall of Jerusalem also is broken down. And the book of Jude, Epistle of the Apostasy. <laughs> so these were books that he wrote, which were based to a large extent on his sermons. And uh, uh, I think if you want some good Sunday reading, uh, these books are really quite good. He also, of course, was involved during the years of the World War II and then the following years as we were fighting against communism and Soviet Union's impact uh, in the world. And then uh, he was quite suspicious of the United Nations, uh, which uh, was sort of like the beginning of a world government in his view. Uh, he wrote several books defending freedom and free enterprise, The Rise of the Tyrant in 1945, and then the next year, the author of Liberty, and uh, later on, The Modern Tower of Babel. Uh, these were books which uh, give a good biblical and uh, theological and practical support for the idea of free enterprise and freedom against communism and socialism. Uh, he wrote also, of course, books dealing with the church uh, and the apostasy of the day, the liberal modernist view of versus the biblical view, uh, 20th century reformation in 1945, and then later he wrote Servants of Apostasy, Outside the Gate. Outside the Gate was a book uh, dealing with his experiences with the Billy Graham organization. Uh, and then The Death of a Church in 1967, when the Presbyterian Church adopted its new confession, he uh, wrote this book, The Death of a Church, uh, showing detailed study of the new confession compared to the old one and how it is so changed. So his sermons, his books, he produced many documentaries, uh, you call them scrapbooks, maybe 100 pages uh, with newspaper articles and uh, things related to a particular topic dealing with uh, apostasy, of the World Council, for example. Uh, he was active when uh, Russian churchmen would come to America who were actually these men actually were agents of the KGB, and there was testimony to that effect from various uh, investigations of the government. And uh, he would compile this into like a notebook or a scrapbook and then distribute it on his radio broadcast. And uh, uh, various documentaries, one I just wrote down the title, The Truth About the Federal Council of Churches and the Kingdom of God, uh, written, for example, in 1950. Uh, I, uh, I don't have time really to go into all his radio work and his other areas of activity, but uh, this lesson today deals with sort of the beginning of his life and his impact on our denomination. And uh, many, many things we can learn, I think, from his life. Uh, one thing is that he had tremendous energy. Uh, he seemed like he was never tired. Uh, even as an older man, you see him get up early, make broadcasts, travel on the airplane, go places, give speeches. Uh, tremendous energy. Also, as far as his personal life is concerned, uh, no hint of any kind of scandal regarding uh, he had a very good marriage and was faithful in all those areas of life. Uh, financially, uh, he never, uh, as far as, you know, uh, like many people do, try to make a lot of money in this position. He was always very frugal in his way of life uh, to the very end, and in many ways uh, was an example in those areas. Of course, uh, none of us is perfect, and every ministry has some drawbacks, and it's no, no need now to go into those things, but I think uh, we can certainly be grateful that God raised him up when he did, and he brought many people into the, uh, you might say, into the fight uh, to recognize their Savior to recognize the scriptures as needing to be defended and being willing to speak out against apostasy and evil when it shows itself. So uh, we can remember these good things and I think profit from them.